is absolutely wild as Fern Gagne's all-star wrestling goes coast to coast and continent to continent, the greatest wrestlers in the world. He may be an apprentice carpenter, but I guarantee you he is a seasoned ring veteran. I've been hit with bar stools, bar rags, bar maids. I'm talking to you! They're scared that Hulkamania is still running wild. Oh, yeah. I got a big fat wife and nine kids at home, and I gotta feed them. And take a look at Jesse the body in real life. Open your hand once if you would. You want to see it? <laughs> this is absolutely unbelievable. Totally, completely out of control. He's coming in over the top. Hey! Look out! I absolutely love that intro, no question about it. Hey, my name is Chris Tubbs. Welcome into AWA Unleashed. There's a word that we like to use to describe this podcast, and it is called preeminent. I know what it means, but it sounded really cool, and we keep using it. If anybody ever knows what that word means, let me know, because it just sounded really cool. Two other guys that are pretty cool. I won't tell it to their face, but I'll tell it, uh, you know, via, you know, the stream yard that we're using. It's Mick Karch and Joe Chupik. Hi, cool guys. Hey, Chris. Busy week for you. We'll get to that in just a second. But uh, just a, a reference to that show open because Chupik's going to get put over again. Stan Hansen talking about his wife and nine kids. Mm -hmm. Didn't Heath Slater also have nine kids? According to the storyline, does that seem to be like a recurring theme in the business? Whatever you get to get that sympathy angle, you have the number nine, number nine. You, you, know, you, mean, I, you mean wrestling repeats itself? Never. No. I mean, not, 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 there, yeah, not, nine kids. Like, I feel more sympathetic for the wife. <laughs> yeah, well, got <laughs> to feed them. So let's talk about you before we get into the show, because I, okay. I saw a, uh, a photograph online here, and I have a question about it. Okay, let me so see if, if I know which photo you're talking about here. Oh, oh really? Uh, no, I don't, well, I don't even know. Oh, is this the, uh, I believe this is, this is the one? That's the one right there. Now, yeah, that, that, that's been all over like two social media pages and both of them have my name on it somehow. Well, here's my qu somehow. Here's <laughs> here's my here's my imagine that. Here's my question to you. I, yes. I recognize you. You look great, you know, sartorial splendor or whatever they call it. Who's that guy next to you? I I don't know, man. It's it's the greatest of all time with I the guy just walked into the building and just got a mic. He started doing some sort of woo, so I, I don't I don't know. Is he a member of the Wu Tang Clan? I I don't know. Is that you know Method Man? I, I don't know. I know who I I still have not been able to figure out who that guy is that came in and wanted a picture with me. You know what's interesting? You know I I would have figured that a big time station like that would have had security, but then I also started to think, well, they let you into the building pretty consistently so it, it you know there may be a little bit of a jiggle there. jiggle jiggle it's it's like a good toilet all you do is jiggle the handle and you get what you need oh <laughs> uh, here we go again <laughs> <laughs> too much goofing guys too much goofing oh too much goofing too much great goofing. picture by the way great yeah, picture of you yeah uh, he was uh he was doing some uh promotion for AEW because as we're as we're recording this we've got AEW is in Minneapolis uh, at Target Center for Dynamite and Rampage. And he was in the radio station uh, yesterday doing some promotion before the show. So uh, I was, you know, believe it or not, I do actually work outside of this. Uh, but no, we, they're, they're like, hey, you know, Ric Flair's in the building. You want to, you know, you want to come and meet him? And I'm like, sure. I've never met a wrestler before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just well, great, just, great picture. Nonetheless. Yeah, it was. You know, it's it's fun. It you take advantage of those situations, and still at 74 years old, like I, I can tell you this, and I know it's not AWA. The effect that old school wrestling we'll bring it back around. There's a certain aura about certain individuals that have been around and that are legends. Flair at 74 walks into the building. 
and people are like, that's Ric Flair. You don't get that very often nowadays. I no, mean, you might have your wrestling fans that know, but one of our news girls, Taylor Rivera, I think she's like maybe in her mid-20s, she's like, oh, it's Ric Flair. She knew who he was. And I, I'm not saying anything against Taylor because she's an awesome, awesome person. But like, that's when you know wrestling transcends. There are certain individuals that transcend. And whether or not you like him, you can't keep those alligators down. Absolutely. Great point, Chris. You know, it's uh, you got Flair up there. You got Hulk Hogan, arguably, you know, where it's, uh, that, as you said, transcending all forms of yeah. entertainment and society and everything else. But uh, great picture. I love the old school reference you just made right now. And uh, let's talk old school wrestling. All right, let's do it. Uh, today is another no DQ and a because we've got a lot of we got a lot of questions, guys, and, and we still we want to try and get to them, especially as we kind of, you know, look to, to 2024. So we do have some more questions that we want to try and get to. First of all, if you're not a member of our fan page on uh, Facebook, definitely Jeremy and Brandon and uh, and um, Brian, Brian. God, I'm so sorry. Brian's going to kick my butt for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Go to our go to our Facebook page. I'm still so wound up about Flair. Uh, go to you know go to our Facebook page. Just become a fan there because we post some extra you know fun little ditties on there, as well as subscribe to the YouTube channel. You guys um, can't ask enough of that. Just subscribe, rate, review, or whatever platform that you're on. All of that, all of that helps us of of our growing. And I'm gonna put that up there as well. So uh, that's pretty much all i've got here and uh we uh we ready to go we're ready to go let's get those questions let's all right, do it guys. let's uh let's get to it here and the first one is for you mick from denny gilmer i've heard your reference uh, awa announcer marty o'neill on many occasions never saw his work how does he rate with the other announcers in awa history Marty O'Neill is my favorite announcer in AWA history, probably because, you know, he was the guy that I first saw uh, at nine years old when I turned on the TV. Marty O'Neill was great because there was nothing flamboyant about Marty. He asked a question. He held the microphone. There's a great picture of Marty and the crusher. Uh, Marty was so nondescript. I, I think it, he was maybe five, six, five, seven tops. And like I say, he would ask the question, let the wrestlers put themselves over. Uh, there was no mugging for the camera. There was no hyperbole. Uh, Marty O'Neill was absolute legendary, and he was a regular guy. He was the kind of guy that you would, uh, you know, chum up with at the bar and, and talk every sport, not only wrestling, softball, baseball, golf, whatever it was. Uh, love Marty O'Neill. What a legacy in the AWA. And he was the uh, the athlete, quite the baseball player, I understand. He certainly uh, was, yeah. You, you know, you look at him, you wouldn't think that. But, Mick, I agree with you. Marty, when Mean Gene took over for Marty, I I, I was disappointed in, in – well, because I wasn't able to see Marty anymore. Mean Gene molded his own – character which is which is what he became he molded himself into his own character but wasn't marty o'neill marty was still the um put it this way it was marty was a sports interviewer and yes. wrestling was still doing the sport and i think that's pro. key and, and i think that's key to it it's like the announcer helps keep it in that realm of reality and legitimacy exactly and mean gene did the same thing in, in, in a manner of speaking, but he had, you know, he had his character. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the mean gene, he wasn't Gene Okerlund, he became mean gene. And so that's the difference between the two. I'm not saying which one is better for worse because they're different, but damn watching Marty was fun. Sure was. And, and think about the announcers back in those days. It wasn't about, it wasn't about like how they appeared, not to say that, you know, today, nowadays, it's like, 
you got to look a certain way. You got to act a certain way. You were, like you guys said, you could take them seriously because there was that element of sport to it. Whereas now it's all broken down and it's like, you don't, I can't really look at it the same as like a sports interview. It's an entertainment interview and it's portrayed that way and it's conducted that way. And I, I, I don't know. I, I kind of think, I think that's a really good way to kind of bring it back together. You guys. Yeah, no question about it. And Marty, I, I would say if you're going to liken Marty O'Neill to anybody from hit past history, it would be Gordon solely light uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, Gordon took the sport seriously, presented it seriously like it was athletic competition. Yeah. I think the only difference was that Marty was more of a regular guy where every once in a while Gordon would, you know, toss the, the million dollar words in there or, you know, define a hold. Marty didn't do that. Marty was like you or I sitting there watching wrestling, Vern Gagne and the Crusher back in the mm -hmm. day. So God love Marty O'Neill. God rest his soul. Great guy. Uh, this one uh, for you, Mick, as well. Both of you guys can chime in on this from Michael Romanski. Can you talk about Hulk Hogan's early days as a heel in the AWA? Uh, it wasn't very long lived that he was a heel. Uh, Hogan, of course, was feuding. Uh, or, or was portrayed as a heel out in the WWF before he came into town. Uh, Rocky Three hit the movie theaters, and Vern saw something in Hulk Hogan, but he brought Johnny Valiant in with him uh, to be a mouthpiece. And for the first couple of interviews that they did, Hogan wouldn't even face the camera. All you saw was this big monstrous back, and Johnny Valiant uh, was holding back, showing Hulk Hogan's face, uh, to the audience, uh, didn't last very long. The people just were enamored with Hogan right from the get-go. They hadn't seen anything like him here. But why, why were they enamored with him? Was it because of how he was portrayed with the back? It's like, was he kind of this unknown and we want to know more about him? Or, I mean, what, what was the hook? He wasn't an unknown, Chris, because of the movie. Yeah, uh, okay. when that's how. That's what, absolutely, that's what did it for him. And again, the look of Hulk Hogan was like so unique. And I don't want to use the incredible because, you know, obviously that's an you know, easy pop there. But it was his look. It was the Rocky Three movie. It was, it was just everything. And people weren't buying it. That They wanted to cheer this guy right away. Right away. Kind of like they didn't want to cheer Jerry Blackwell right away. They wanted to boo Jerry Blackwell. They wanted to cheer Hulk Hogan. And thank God Ver made the switch. Well, how, how do you not like a guy named Thunderlips? <laughs> well, that might be your deal. I, you know, I, I, yeah. I personally don't care, but, you know. Ooh. Well, it was, August, it was August of 1980 when the first interview was done with luscious Johnny Valiant and Hogan from the, in the ring from the Minneapolis auditorium. I don't know if it was before or after the matches, but I just remember seeing the interview and well, let's put it this way, Mick, you knew luscious Johnny Valiant. Yep. Um, not only could he talk, but he, I, he did it without taking a breath. <laughs> right. You know, so That's it was right. a good, uh, it was a good pairing. You had somebody in Hogan who really could not do a promo yet. And then luscious Johnny Valiant who could talk for, well, shit, for himself, for Hogan and, you know, everybody else on the production crew doing the interview. But uh, you're right. Didn't take long. Hogan, it, once once Rocky Three came out, he had baby face written all Absolutely. over him. Absolutely. So... Was there any, do you guys know, was there any concern with allowing Hogan to cut his own promos at that point? Because the body was there, but if he had this mouthpiece, was there ever any concern that he wasn't going to be able to, to cut a babyface promo? If you talk to Vernon, Greg, yeah, there was concern. And Greg, of course, will always say, you know, that he and he and Vernon, especially Vern, schooled Hogan on the art of the promo. And when he was ready to, do, if you watch early Hogan promos, even as a solo in the AWA, he was still green. He was still mm -hmm. kind of stumbling over himself a little bit. Uh, but 
all of a sudden, boy, when he found it, when he found that niche, when he found that train, he wrote it and he wrote it hard. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah, Chris, I mean, to your question, yeah, they had concerns. That's why they had Luscious Johnny Valiant yeah. come yeah. in to manage them because he could, Hogan could still, he could not do a promo yet. He just wasn't there. He had the look. Uh, his in-ring ability was still suspect, and his interviews were still mm -hmm. suspect. But, hey, we all know what happened. <laughs> Did Joe and Chris, you got to remember, before he came here, he had Freddie Blassie as his mouthpiece. Yeah, and that's true, yeah. yeah. So Hogan really wasn't accustomed to doing solo interviews. But I think history will bear out that the AWA made the right call. Yep. And you can also thank uh, Gary DeRusha for part of the Hulkamania run on Wild getting over the way that he yeah. did. You betcha. Thank you, yep. Gary. No residuals, no royalties. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he'd be living. Uh, he'd be living high on like Lake. Uh, you know, I don't know, Lake Shatak or something at this point. Hey, uh, this is for <laughs> <laughs> down around Slayton in my territory, southwestern Minnesota. Oh boy. Uh, uh, yeah, you like that? Good one. He could. He could have the best place on Lake Shatak, though, guaranteed. Hey, this is for you, Joe, from Deb Pomroy. Uh, she's a big fan of the Midnight Rockers since their AWA days. I don't know why Larry Nelson's here. We can put your name in here well uh, as well. Is it true that Larry Nelson and Joe Chupik partied with them into the wee hours? I I, yes. I, I added Joe Chupik into that. Uh, yes, yes, and and pretty much yes. <laughs> um, yeah, L Larry liked to uh, have his fun. Um, I did too, but I was, you know, shit. In 1985, I was 20 years old, and so 21 when the Rockers became something. The shenanigans with those three on screen right there, and I'm not talking about me, Tubbsy, and, and Karch, but the other photo. Uh, oh, God, I'm just glad that there weren't smartphones back in those days. Um, I've always said, uh, you know, people have skeletons in their closet. Well, the skeletons in my closet are afraid of their own skeletons. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, Larry, uh, man, wee hours of the morning uh, was, shall we say, commonplace when, when we were on the road, especially in Las Vegas. God bless Larry Nelson. Yeah, I, I'm looking at that in the... The sunglasses and the, is that a Hall and Oates shirt that Marty Jannetty's wearing or what is that? Oates says something with Oates. I mean, is that Hall and, I, I don't know. Oates, yeah. Coates, I don't know. Oates, Oates. Yeah. Uh, Oates, Oates. Larry, Larry Nelson, if you ever get a chance to read his book, um, Larry pretty much laid out in his book, in his uh, autobiography, the party that he did with the Midnight Rockers, and he lived to tell about it. So, mm -hmm. you know, hats off to uh, Larry Nelson. Well, a little quick side story about that. I think I may have shared this on this podcast before, but um, I hadn't heard from Larry since he left the AWA. I think I was about 87-ish at some point. Fast forward to about 2000, I think it was, he calls me out of the blue about nine o'clock at night. He was living in Florida at the time. And uh, well, let's just say, I think Larry might've had a libation or 10. He <laughs> just goes, Polish Joe, Larry Nelson. I wrote a book. You're in it. I'm going to send you a copy. Hope all is well. Click. And he, Hangs up the phone. I, 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 I literally, I think I said, Hey, Larry, how the hell? And she goes in. He was lit up. He, he made the Rockefeller Christmas tree look like it was blacked out. Larry was lit up big time. So he did send me a copy of the book and was very complimentary, uh, you know, in, in what he had said about me. But yeah, uh, read the book and you can, uh, uh, who sent that? Deb? Get Uncle Larry's book, yeah. and you will you will uh, relive some of those instances with the Midnight Rockers and others from a uh, Deb Palmer, and, and that must be the original drunk dial right there, Larry Nelson drunk dialing Joe Chupik. 
<laughs> tell him about the yep. Tell him about and the he book. did it well. <laughs> I love love that story, Joe. Uh, hey, this is for you guys uh, from Ike Hansen, uh, Hankins rather. Sorry about that, Ike. Uh, I've watched Super Clash three between Kerry Von Erich and Jerry Lawler. I really believe that was the death knell for the AWA with the conclusion. Your thoughts? Um, horrible conclusion. Uh, they did not have a big crowd anyway, and they pissed off everybody that was there. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, of course, uh, Terry Von Erich was on the verge of beating Jerry Lawler for the AWA championship, but because a cut had been opened on Terry's uh, head earlier on in the match, referee Marty O'Neill or Marty Miller uh, stepped in and uh, and stopped the match and awarded the victory to Jerry Lawler. You got to remember, the AWA had already pissed people off several years earlier with the Hulk Hogan, Nick Bockwinkle situation in St. Paul. So the fans were used to AWA controversy. But again, if you look at the size of the house at Super Class 3, and then you piss people off besides, not a good night in the history of the AWA. And I would, I would tend to agree that that was, if not the death knell, they were getting there. Well, I'll put it this way to use an analogy that the AWA leading up to Super Clash 3 was already involved in a really bad car accident and was on life support. That match was essentially, to me, pulling the plug on the AWA. The match itself, or in this case, pulling the plug, isn't what killed the AWA. It was the accident leading up to yeah. being mm -hmm. on life support. It just, it, it was time. I mean, that was, that was the, beyond the beginning of the end, but to me, that was the end of the AWA in December of 88. The last couple of years were spinning wheels and nothing but mud coming out. Here, here's my question about that. Like, and maybe this just speaks to the ineptitude of the booking and the promotion at the time. I look at it and you've got two really well-known main eventers in Kerry Von Erich and Jerry Lawler. But one's in world class, one's in the USWA in Memphis. For those two to come together for an AWA title and you screw up the booking, how can you screw up a booking between Kerry Von Erich and Jerry Lawler. Like you've got to be completely inept to, to do that. Chris, Chris, real simple answer, believe it or not. Yeah. You got, you have to remember what super clash, the attempt that super clash three was. They were trying to put together multiple promoters and that's why the finish was the way it was. You had to try to appease WCCW mm -hmm. and AWA slash Mid-South Wrestling. Yeah. When you get two promoters in a room, good luck trying to get them to agree on anything. It's, you know, and especially back in those days. That entire coalition, the attempt to take over Vince by all the promoters working together was a, a freaking disaster. Never worked. Egos were flying all over the place. And look, even afterward, look what happened with Jerry Lawler, even maintaining him as AWA champion and not switching the title to Kerry Von Erich. The wheels fell off of that bus, too. So everything was mm. fucked up back then. And uh definitely the end was in sight. Yep. Seems, yeah, it seems just very convoluted, you know, being a, a youngster and just seeing at it, you know, the, the basic, you know, very shallow, you know, point that I've got. Uh, this is for me from the Harris family. I know there aren't a lot of old AWA guys uh, around. I'd love to hear from Brad Reagans or Lars Anderson about their AWA time. What are, the, what are the chances of getting them on the show? I, I would love to... From what I understand, and it's been this way for years, that Brad Reagans is just, he's just kind of a hard guy to get a hold of. I think he'd be great. I think there'd be a lot of, of really good stuff. And I think people would love to hear from Brad Reagans. 
I I don't know how accessible he is. That's that's my understanding that he he's just he's kind of a hard guy to to get a hold of. Lars Anderson, you know, I would you know I would definitely be. It's all about availability for these guys and and the wanting to. And there's a lot of things behind the scenes that I I wish we could unveil more. But there's just some things that we have to keep under lock and key for various reasons. Yeah, I I don't know. I feel like Lars Anderson out of the two, Lars would be more likely than Brad, and, and I would I would love them both. I saw Lars not that long ago on another podcast, so he's still out there. Uh, logistically, I believe he lives in Hawaii, as uh, the late Sheik Adnan uh, lived in Hawaii. So, you know, time-wise, we would certainly have to work on that to get it all set up. I would love to hear his stories. Uh, legendary tough guy in the business. And, Chris, you hit it right on the head about our buddy Brad Ringitz. There's Lars, uh, a more recent picture of uh, Larry Hainimi, Lars Anderson. Uh, Brad Ring, it's even the people that know him in and around the area, whether it's Wayne Bloom or John Nord or, you know, uh, Joe Hennig, they've all told me good luck trying to get a hold of Brad because he's kind of reclusive. He basically has stepped away from the business. The only time I've seen Brad in years was at Vern's funeral. Uh, so, yeah, I think Brad is going to be a, a tough nut to crack, but. You never know. You know, we have worked miracles on this show before, and uh, let's see what happens. And any any idea why? I, I mean, I just because I feel like there's so much that Brad could could bring to the table if he wanted to go out there. And I feel like people would just gravitate to whatever stories that he would have. There are guys like Brad out there, Chris. That once they got away from the wrestling mm -hmm. business, I don't know if it's bitterness or just you know I did that. This was part of my life, and now I'm moving on to something else. I know Brad had his share of injuries and had some surgeries, and you know he's I don't know how old Brad is. I would guess he's you know sixty some years old, and he probably just you know no no thanks move been on. there done that. Me, yeah. Well, and this is just an observation on my part. I don't know this for a fact, but to me, I, I never got the sense that Brad was comfortable in the spotlight or on camera. Right. I've said it before on this podcast. Yeah, I, I mean, can see Brad that. I can see that. were not, were not good. <laughs> they just, there, he did some good ones, but overall Brad's body of work doing an interview, it just wasn't great. In fact, oftentimes we would, put him, we'd have a, a two or two and a half minute interview block. He would get half of that time because it, it that was just Brad. And so I'm guessing that he's not making himself available to the public because he just doesn't want to be in the spotlight. And, and so be it. You, you, you can but respect that. Absolutely. You know, yeah. interestingly yeah. enough, you know, somebody once asked me, what was the worst interview you ever did on SNR? In terms of quality and just overall dullness, I mean, I've got razors that were sharper than when I brought on Brad Ringens and Wayne Bloom simultaneously to do an interview. Uh, it just went nowhere. So to Joe's point, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that could be maybe it's, uh, you know, Brad is just not comfortable doing it. But again, he's a great guy away from the yeah. ring. One of the one of the legit strongest guys ever in wrestling. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. We're, we're always working and hustling you guys. Like there's always, we're always, uh, well, not we, I mean, M Mick and Joe are the ones that are doing it. I'm just kind of along for the ride. I use their contacts full disclosure. I'm riding those coattails. I got no problem with that. Uh, this is oh, for oh, 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 okay. Uh, Mr. Rick Flair's valet. Valet. Hey, so wow. <laughs> valet. <laughs> valet. Man. I, I, Manageress. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh my God! Yes, and oh my God! Hey, more power to you, man. Yeah, I get. I get. There's a, a couple times today you've left me speechless. It's like I want to come up with something, but I got nothing, Joe. Sorry. Right. Good. No. Good job, you guys. Good job. Hey, this is for you, Mick from Stu Cats. He's been a fan since 1960. He always thought uh, Ivan Putsky was a cheap knockoff of the mighty Igor. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about Igor? I think he was way more believable. Love the show. 
Thank you, Stu. And uh, I'll hand it over to you, Mick. I would agree 100%. And yeah, I think a lot of people who have followed wrestling for a long time uh, would also agree. First of all, th there's the, the point that Mighty Igor was the first one to do it. Uh, to have the, you know, the innocent, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, socially uh, inept uh, wrestling fan, strong man sitting in the front row uh, who couldn't speak English very well. The mighty Igor, of course, was the legendary Dick Garza. And there he is. That's a, a picture of strong man Garza. So I would say that was had to be early 60s, late 50s, a former Mr. Michigan uh, came into the AWA area again, sitting in the front row of the matches at uh, All-Star Wrestling. And eventually, you know, the, some of the heels were picking on him. And all of a sudden, you got the strongest guy in the world, you know, taking off that, uh, that, that trench coat and revealing himself to be the mighty Igor. And there's a, a shot to show you how he advanced in the AWA. Look at that main event. And that is pretty damn close to uh, how many years ago, 1965, wow. Vern Gagne and the mighty Igor taking on uh, pretty boy Larry Hennig and handsome Harley Race. And uh, just, just almost, aside, almost 59 years ago, guys. My God. And, and Chris, look at that opening bout. Look who's in the opening bout. Yeah, uh, guy, guy, they, guy Taylor. Guy Taylor and his opponent, Terry Funk. Wow. Uh, you know, and uh, so you know, a lot of history in, in that particular uh, program. Uh, Ivan Putsky did a good job in his role, but I think when you compare the two, the original is the better of the two. Uh, big fan of Mighty Igor. I think he portrayed that, that character very well. I got to just, uh, they're both Polish characters. And uh, I, I barely remember the original Igor, just because I'm younger than, than Karch. But I, I remember Putsky. But the thing is, I'm looking back at their characters now. Um, it was uh, the style or indicative of what wrestling was, which back at that time, which is really stereotypes. Yes, sir. And in, in terms of uh, Igor and Putsky, while they didn't come across as what I remember growing up as, and, and uh, Mick, you probably remember this all too well, but when I was growing up, um, the dumb Pollock jokes. Absolutely. Were, you know, were very, and, and I've never been offended by them as long as they're funny. And so the two Polish characters that we're talking about they were both aloof and fun. And that's what like, you know, everybody liked uh, about them. Um, I, I've got to go with Ivan Putsky on this one only because that's what I remember more than the mighty Igor. Next question. Yes, sir. Here we go. All right. Let's get to the, uh, the next question for me from Jim Dahl. One of my favorite guests on your show was Barry Darsa, a huge fan in your vast files. Do you happen to have a picture of him? When he was at Robbinsdale, I believe we do. Oh boy! Oh and boy. let me make sure I've got the right one here. Uh, Barry Darsa as his oh, character. My. Barry Darsa, yeah. There's uh, Crusher Cruise, Jim. He's very, Good he's moment. very distinct. Like, what? Yeah. Once you, once you've seen him, you're like, there's no denying who that is. Isn't that something? And I don't know how old he was there, if that's a senior picture, sophomore picture, but he's already, you can tell he's a big brute already. Uh, I love Barry Darso, one of the greatest guys that we've had in the business um, on our show, even though, you know, he, Joe Chupik alienated him. Uh, yeah, Joe called him a fraud. He, he did. He basically uh, he, said, you're a pussy fraud who's just a wannabe. Yeah, you're a $3 bill. You're, you're a total... Total uh, counterfeit. And yeah, why don't uh, you do something original? You're a cheap knockoff of the Road Warriors. And basically that that uh, destroyed our relationship with Barry Darso going forward. So uh, congratulations to, for that, Jupik. But uh, in all seriousness, what a veteran, what a pro, what an absolute gem of a guy, yeah. Barry Darso. I, I shouldn't say anything because no. I would become no. more of a heel. 
Yeah, let's let's move on. This you don't, you don't belong in this question, Joe. Moving on. Uh, for for Mick and Joe from Nathan Van Gorder, you three deliver the goods every week. Well, let's that's those two guys. Let's be honest. Uh, thank you. I read somewhere that Rick Martel kind of shies away from the convention scene. How do you guys rank him on the list of AWA champions? I'll hang up and listen. I love that question. Being a radio guy, uh, we have people that will ask a question. I'll hang up and listen. I wouldn't rank me personally. I wouldn't rank him near the top just because I think the history of the AWA is so rich when you go back to the heyday. But in terms of my era, I feel like Rick Martel and his athletic ability and what he could do was, I felt like as an athlete, he could hang with anybody and, I'm sad that he doesn't want to, he doesn't do the convention thing. Kind of like, you know, Brad Reagan, just kind of, you know, reclusive, but Rick Martell, extremely underrated, I think overall, but I wouldn't, I couldn't put him as one of the top, but in my era, he's absolutely right up there. Chris, I couldn't agree with you more on all counts. You know, when you've got the Nick Bockwinkles, Vern Gagne's, Crushers, Mad Dog Machines of the world is, you know, previous AWA champions, you know, going back in history. Uh, yeah, there's no comparison. But for his time, Rick Martell, I 100% agree with this, so underrated. And again, you're looking at 1985. I believe was the year that uh, Rick was champion in 85, 86. And what, it wasn't the, it, it wasn't the perception of getting away from the bigger, stronger guys going into the, the smaller, more athletic. It wasn't that trend kind of starting. I mean, I know you still had the Hogan's and everything, but I, I felt like you were kind of starting to see the little bit of the changing of the guard in terms of like the body types of the champions. Absolutely. Good point there, too. And I, I think it was a matter of timing with Rick Martell. Of course, he had come off tremendous success in WWF, uh, both as a singles and a tag team wrestler. Uh, Rick Martell, from what I understand, and this goes to it's a shame that he doesn't do the convention circuit, uh, is, uh, and I've seen this, one of the nicest, most fan-friendly gentlemen interacting with the fans. I saw him, I believe was at uh, Cauliflower Alley Club. Just a terrific guy. And he's another guy, you know, he took a step away from the business. He did what he did in wrestling, but as a champion, uh, pure class, 100%. I, um, I agree with most of the points. I will have to add for me, uh, and it wasn't when he was with the AWA, but Rick Martell, when he became the model, uh, that was the Rick Martell that, in hindsight, I wish we would have had in the AWA as champion. Um, he he pulled off that model gimmick, I thought, exquisitely. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was tough to be a baby face back. And it's tough to be a baby face, period. People yeah. have to like you. You have to do something that really does it. Hogan had Rocky three. Rick Martell was just a really good looking guy put together. Um, interviews were all right, but when he turned heel, oh man, skyrocketed up. Yeah, and, and we, we and, and, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. One, one other point when we're talking yeah. about greatest AWA champions, if you really think about it, the actual number of different wrestlers who were champions. Up and yeah, I'll, I'll go up until Stan Hansen really wasn't that many. That's true. You know, that's in the 60s, point. there were some changes, yeah. but it was mostly Vern. And then Nick had it for how many years? And then Vern had it for how many years? So the number wise, actually, that'd be a good thing. I want to check that out. There might have been a dozen AWA champions. You yeah, know that, what? That's a good point. Actually, Joe, yeah. Joe there were 19. 19. Yeah, I mean, you bring mm. that up. But 19 champions over a 30-year span is not a lot of champions. And you mentioned, you know, a lot of times they would be multiple-time champions. Crusher, Vern, Mad Dog, Nick, uh, right down, down the line. But overall, babyface or heel, Rick Martell, class act. Yes. And, and, and you guys were mentioning the, the, the model character after Strike Force broke up at WrestleMania five. When we talked to Tito Santana... And Tito wanted to be the heel coming out of that feud. I remember that because 
one of the questions was, did you ever work as a villain? And he was like, no, he, he pitched it to Vince. I like Tito, but I feel like Rick Martel and the whole arrogance thing. I feel like Rick Martel probably pulled it off better than Tito could. And, and Tito, I'm sure would have been a fantastic bad guy, but Rick Martel, the way that that happened in that match and all of the leading up to it, I felt like it just worked for Rick Martel. And, and yeah, maybe, maybe we should have gotten that, you know, back in the AWA. Uh, again, it's a matter of timing, but yeah. uh, Martel aced it like Kurt Hennig did with the Mr. Perfect character. And, uh, you know, in wrestling history, Rick Martel is right up there. He's a talent. Yep. No question. We got about 20 minutes here left guys. And, and we're, we probably won't get to all of these and, we will, we'll, you know, again, we'll roll more over because we've always got more questions. That's why we do these shows is because we don't want to backlog all of these questions. And if, if you guys are going to take the time to send us the questions, we want to do our best to get all of these in. The only thing that we ask is hit the subscribe button for YouTube. Just hit the subscribe button, like rate review, anything you do to interact, it helps the algorithm and it helps some of the behind the scenes stuff that helps the growth of the podcast. And we've got some more things that we're going to work on to uh, to grow because we want to uh, be preeminent. We want to continue to be preeminent. Okay, so there you go. Uh, I'm I, I'm with you 100. All right, better than preempted. That's that's true. Well, or or that, premature. <laughs> that's that sounds like a next you problem. question. Yes, uh, for the boys from Mike the Brick. I've watched several Ken Patera shoot interviews and only uh, can only imagine what a hoot he'd be to have on the pod. Any chance? I'd love it. Ken Patera would be awesome to have. And I feel like I say that about every guest that we have, but all of the guests that the, the, the fans and the people that follow the podcast, all of the names that you guys bring up are so freaking good. Like you get, you guys get it. You guys understand it. Ken Patera would be great. Ken Patera. I wouldn't and, say, I wouldn't talk during the entire interview either. because Well, he wouldn't let you, first of all. And and secondly, probably. let's hope that we got, well, you know, maybe we don't hope that we got Ken on a good day because if Ken was in a bad mood, that would be uh, equally entertaining. Ken Patera is the least bullshit guy out there when it comes to his shoot interviews. He calls a spade a spade. There's no question that he would do it on this podcast. I've known Ken for a long, long time. And what you see is what you get. There's Ken, and that's Dick the Bruiser, ladies and gentlemen, that Ken is putting the, the big squeeze to. Uh, I've said it before on this podcast, one of the most underrated heels in the history of the business. Ken Patera was the real deal. He was so hated. Back in the day, after he did, look at that. How, how about that for a shot? That's uh, jumping Jimmy Brunzel, planting one on Ken Patera. Uh, Ken just recently turned 80 and uh, still quite the character. Personally, I hated when he did that time in, in the in the clink and they came out and made him a baby face in WWF or WWE. I hated it. Uh, that wasn't Ken Patera. Uh, Ken Patera, the heel, unmatched as far as I'm concerned. One quick story about Ken. Um, was doing a fundraiser show, brought in a promotion to South St. Paul High School. It's about 10 years ago. And uh, somebody says, hey, Ken's here. Oh, great. Cool. I'm glad he showed up. And so I go back into the locker room or in the hallway leading to the locker room. And there's Ken. Hey, Ken, how the hell are you doing? Well, he's got a beer in one hand and six pack in the other hand in the little plastic loop <laughs> holding it. And I look at him and go, Ken, do you realize that we are in a high school and that this is a high school fundraiser? You can't, you, you, you can't have that beer in here. Oh, hey, hey, sorry, sorry. I'll dump it out. Well, he did, but... In his mouth. <laughs> um, I've told the story before on this podcast. I, I won't repeat it again. When Ken was actually doing a, a mic check 
for a cable access show that I was doing back in the day. And Ken had him vibe just a little bit before we turned on the camera. And again, he's just doing a mic check. All he had to do was say, testing one, two, three. Uh, Ken did not do that. Uh, Ken pounded his fist on a table and made very derogatory, profane-laden references to Fritz von Erich, which had nothing whatsoever to do with anything. And uh, uh, the other story that I just love, and I told this about Ken, there's an outdoor show Ken is promoting back in the day, and a big storm came up just as the show was going to get started, and all the wrestlers are in a tent getting dressed and playing cards and everything else. Well, a big wind, gust of wind came up, and it wasn't me talking. Uh, probably about a 60-mile-an-hour wind, and up from the moorings, from the posts, goes this tent and starts rolling across the field where this uh, show was going to be held, and Ken had promoted it. So you got all the guys sitting there in their skivvies playing cards and going over finishes and everything else with no roof over them anymore, and they're in full view of the crowd. And needless to say, uh, Ken didn't exactly sing What a Wonderful World uh, at that point, you can only imagine. Uh, but what a great experience that I would love to have Ken on the show. That would be an interesting hour, to say the least. Here we go. Hours. I I mean, if we'd have to go at least two. Oh, God. But, but I would love, I mean, Ken Patera, I feel like there's so much on that. And like you said, you wouldn't get any spin. You wouldn't get any bullshit. What you get w would be raw and authentic and that's what you want you want i mean no pun intended you want it unleashed there you go so all right let, we've got a few more but let's wrap up with this one here guys this is for you mick uh from chuck hanley the third bockwinkle is hardly a common name which leads him to ask the question did nick ever use any aliases he most certainly did and i i don't know all of them that he used I know that in 1960, in the Omaha area, he wore a mask as a baby face. He was the sensational white phantom. And I remember I showed Nick a picture of himself under the mask, and he said, everybody knew it was me. Look at the size of my beak. So, you know, he wasn't fooling anybody. This is very interesting. This is from Buffalo, New York. And Nick is billed as Roy Diamond on this card and the interesting thing is if this is the program page and they're identifying him as nick bockwinkle warren bockwinkle's son but then they they're acknowledging that he's wrestling as roy diamond so talk about breaking kayfabe i i, I just i guess i didn't quite understand the point of uh you know billing nick as as uh, roy diamond and then revealing who he really was but uh those are two aliases i think he also used the name nick bach at one point i don't know but uh uh nick bachwinkle himself um that that was the name that mattered the rest is window dressing isn't that something chris that uh, but well, the, so, so but what you're saying is kayfabe was destroyed 30 years before it was actually destroyed well, at least promoter Pedro Martinez in the in Buffalo, New York, destroyed kayfabe. Nick's great quote about that, he said, they could call me Roy Diamond, they could call me asshole. I didn't care as long as I got paid. So <laughs> that, uh, and, and I believe Nick did get paid that night. But uh, great question. Really appreciate that. Very yeah, that, that, it, it is kind of, you know, now that I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm reading it because I took a look at it when I loaded it. But now that I'm you're you're kind of telling me the the story about it and reading it, I'm like, what the fuck am I looking at? Yeah, it, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah, yeah but, I mean, you know, Nick, Nick got a kick out of it. And again, that goes back 60 plus years. So, uh God rest his soul. Yeah. Chris, I know that you said we're going to wind it up, but I, I know we have one question that I would really like you to get to. And okay, that was which, the last one, the last bullet point. Okay. We'll, we'll get to, we'll get to that one because I, I do want to kind of give a little bit of a preview of what we got coming up here. Tell people to, to kind of be on the lookout for a couple things. Uh, this is, this is for you guys uh, from Diane and AJ Carter. 
Have there ever been any AWA events that had fans riot? Several. Yeah, uh, several. Uh, and uh, we got about uh, five, six minutes for this one here. Okay. Um, there were riots at AWA shows, particularly back in the day. Uh, Bachwinkle Stevens, Rhodes and Murdoch. And, and let, let, yeah, let, let me know when you want me to put that picture up. Please. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I don't want to be premature. Little late, little late there, pal. Train left the station. Um, there's a video out there of a match in Wisconsin where the Road Warriors, I believe, are wrestling uh, Kurt Hennig and I, I forget who else. And uh, a full scale riot started there. The Road Warriors were were the heels at the time, and uh, wound up fighting with the fans who were stupid enough to try to engage the Road Warriors as they were heading back to the locker room. A lot of chairs were flying, and etc. Uh, we've seen a lot of a lot of riots here, but I would say this may be a first. And, and Chris, if you if you've got the photo right here, um, where a promoter had to stop a card and basically retire because of this, uh, ugly crowds force <laughs> wrestling promoter. To call it quits. And this and this is real. This is not something from the onion or no. like a meme or a gif. No. This no. is this is real. This is real. Uh, real headline. I, yeah. I, I, I would assume that you know the promoter was probably having a uh, handsomest fan uh, evening or prettiest lady competition or something, and all of a sudden the ugly crowd showed up, and the man pulled the plug right then and there. Ugly crowds force wrestling promoter to call it quits. Now, I've been at some events where, you know, with all due respect to the, the fans, um, the crowd was 99% ugly and, and, you know, nobody called it quits. But I would like to know exactly what happened. And I don't shoot it. You're, you're kind of an expert on when things go awry at wrestling shows. What happened here, do you think? I have no flipping idea. I, I mean, I, I I understand your sentiment about the, the, the ugly crowd part because, well, I was part of those ugly crowds. So we're still, in, but we're still part of the ugly crowd. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the old saying of uh, got a face made for radio. Well, I got a face made for TV. It's just behind the scenes. Um, you know... <laughs> This one, ugly crowds force wrestling promoter to call it quits. Can you, I, you imagine know, how first, many promoters would be out of business today? I was just going to say, the wrestling business, business who, wouldn't even exist. Who is this promoter? That's what I would first like to know. I, I, could, I couldn't tell you. I, uh, but, Chris, I think you hit it right on the head there. If, if that was the rule of thumb today where every promoter who had an ugly crowd, and I don't mean ugly crowds, ugly crowd, you got to say it that way, yeah. Yeah. Um, went out of business, I think you'd be left with <laughs> WWE. And that's, with all due respect to AEW, I think yeah. that. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't know. Have you seen the WWE crowd? I mean, let's be honest. But see, here's the thing. We're part of it. We're part of this. We're part of the problem. Hey, we're all part of the fucking problem. We are the poster children <laughs> for ugly crowds. Yes. We are the preeminent <laughs> ugliest podcast on the AWA. Love and, it. Damn right. And proud of it. <laughs> Pup. Preeminent ugly podcast. Pup. P U P. <laughs> hey, there's we're another million dollar t shirt idea. We're, we're a there pup. you go. We're a pup. P -U -P. Oh my god! We're just gonna put uh, that on a T-shirt. There would you go. Buy a, would anybody buy a pup T-shirt? No. <laughs> no. Perfect. <laughs> Let's market it. Let's market it. Let's market <laughs> something that nobody would ever hey, buy. Hey, we'd wear them. You yeah. know. <laughs> oh my god! All right. <laughs> oh, uh, you know what? We love our ugly crowd. We love our good-looking crowd. We love our crowd. Everybody, listen, we know that wrestling fans are a different breed. They always have been. That's what makes us special. That's what makes us cool. 
That's what makes us different. And if people don't like us, they can go fuck themselves. Because wrestling is, when it's done right, wrestling is the best entertainment there is. When it is done right, there's nothing better. And I will go, I will take that to the grave. So there we go. We're all part of the preeminent ugly podcast. Everybody's part of that ugly crowd. And I love it. All right. I wanted to make sure that nobody. Yes, I'm the lead pup. The view never changes when you're the head pup. When you're the lead (laughs) pup. Oh my God. Well, good. Hey, at least it went off the rails 55 minutes in instead of five minutes in. So we're making progress. <laughs> we held it together uh, for a while. We did. I had uh, no idea that question was going to go so sideways so quickly. Boy. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, it. Yeah, we we, uh, we lost the grip on the leash right away. We did. At, uh, well, this, pu- this, pup, this pup got away. It's a loose pup. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's get to some shout outs, guys, and then uh, then we'll we'll take it home. Jeremiah Larson, who just coincidentally happens to be my son in law. Uh, Jeremiah is a great fan. We're going to see what it says, Jay. And uh, uh, he has been very supportive of, of this old fart here for a long time. Treats my daughter very, very well. That's all that matters. Hello, yeah. Jeremiah Larson. My shout out goes to Corinne E.S. And the reason I picked her for this one is because she's a her. I love the fact that this isn't just a bunch of old guys or a bunch of, well, ugly guys who are loving the AWA, loving professional wrestling, but we can throw in a beautiful female that raises the bar for us. Suddenly we're not, yeah, we're still ugly. But Corinne, thank you. From the female genre, thank you for being a fan of the podcast and of professional wrestling. And and I'm going to go with another female and Gloria Anderson, Uh, just a a big supporter of the podcast as well. So thank you, Gloria. Thank you for all of the emails. Thank you for all of the comments and, and, you know, always being, uh, being active with us. And uh, see, now you're saying, we can't all be ugly, but that just ruins the gimmick. So I think we just, I think we just blew. No, no, the- Chris, don't worry. Yeah, we, you, the three of us. Oh, okay. We're still, we're we're still, still ugly. ugly. Okay, good, good. I, I wanted to yeah, make sure yeah. that we were still okay. We're still ugly and hideous, but everybody. Okay. Yeah, our that- fan, our fan base is beautiful, but yeah, we're we're but ugly. I'm gonna go so far as to say vile. Preeminently vile and ugly. Yep. Too many words. 